Father Stephen Freeman, thank you so much for joining me on the show here today. Uh, Austin, it's good to be with you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. You know, we were just uh, joking before we, we got on here. We're, we're going to be talking about your wonderful book, uh, Face to Face, Knowing God Beyond Our Shame. And I said, you know, I'm excited to talk about this topic today. I think it's going to be really fun. And uh, we had a good laugh about the fact that uh, fun and shame were used in the same sentence. Uh, but I think this is going to be a very helpful conversation. And I'll, I'll tell people, you know, we, we might get, get into some, some deep and heavy stuff here. But I think if people are willing to kind of listen with us and to reflect. I think this could be a really, really powerful experience for them, just as, as reading your book was for me. And, and I want to start with this idea that that shame isn't just kind of like this abstract interest for you. You know, I don't get the impression that you were sitting around one day saying, you know, what what kind of thing in my ivory tower should I contemplate today? How about shame? Uh, let, let's uncover that. Uh, but but it's, a, it's yeah. a deeply personal topic, right? And so, you know, I know we're it kind is. of starting it in is. the deep end here, but could you share a bit of your journey with shame and anxiety that, that led you to writing this book? Why this book? Well, I'll say something about anxiety, uh, which I had no idea was had any connection to shame, though it does. Uh, and not just for me, but gen it's it's actually a, a good generalization. It's not all there is about shame. But uh, starting uh, at what seemed to be out of the blue when I was about 19 years old, uh, I was in, uh, well, 19 or 20, I was starting college. I spent a couple of years living in a commune uh, between high school and college because I'm that old. Uh, but anyway, uh, around age 19 or 20, I started having panic attacks. And this was in the early 70s. Uh, they actually didn't have the phrase panic attack back then. Uh, it was not a common diagnosis. Uh, I got labeled something else. My sophomore year of college, I spent a week in the hospital uh, being treated wrongly. Uh, and basically, after a week, checked myself back out and uh, began a very long journey of, uh, A, learning how to live with a panic attack uh, and having them frequently. After a while, uh, you don't need shame to bring on a panic attack. After a while, panic attacks become their own cause and just uh, they get triggered. And once your body learns to do it, it can kind of go on. But anyway, uh, that you you sort of white knuckle your way through your life. It's a miserable way to live. I mean, in, in between, you can feel fine, but it's still, you wind up uh, sort of shrinking your world over the years uh, into more and more, like I, I got to where I couldn't fly on planes and all kinds of things. I, I didn't want to take train rides, uh, absolutely panicked and go over tall bridges, things like that. And those are just examples, uh, crowded places I couldn't do. Um, and um, I mean, but I had a life, uh, family, and a career. Uh, but uh, finally, uh, at age 58, and I'm very much simplifying here, but at age 58, it really uh, just became so out of control uh, in, in my life uh, that I went in for further treatment. Uh, my bishop gave me uh, time away, and uh, the medication the doctor had me on was way less than helpful eventually. And so I went into hospital. Um, and it was in that context, uh, in, in the context, and it's, it's a very vulnerable position to be in, especially when you're a priest by then, you know, and uh, you're in, you know, in a hospital being treated, treated with other people with everything from who have issues of eating disorders, suicides, drug addicts, whatever, you got all these things. And um, you're there doing your thing. And um, but it was in that context that uh, though I had known some things and could have, you know, done a sermon or two on the topic of shame. Uh, it's just it's I learned a lot more uh, inside, but especially uh, discovered some things in my own life that allowed me to see uh, how that dynamic was at work. Um, and. Uh, that kind of really opened up some avenues for treatment that were wonderful. Um, I, uh, I mean, the good news about it is to say that 
uh, I came out of that situation and within six weeks of coming out of treatment, I no longer had panic attacks and I've not had a single one. And that's been, oh, 12, 13 years back. So that's that's a very, uh, gee, as success rates go, that's amazing. Uh, I rarely hear that kind of recovery in someone's life. Um, it opened up the topic for me in some ways. And I began to, uh, I mean, I've been writing a blog since uh, 2006. And so I'm, and, and I was writing all throughout that process. Uh, and um, so I've done a lot of theological reflection, which includes, you know, I mean, first off, a good rule of thumb is never waste suffering. I mean, if you're going to suffer, don't waste it. Find something useful to do with it. And I mean, you're a priest, you're hearing confessions, you're counseling with people. And in my situation, also writing internationally and engaging with people with questions internationally. And uh, so um, I had a, an opportunity to go to England uh, during the next few years. Um, and spent some time with uh, Father uh, Zacharias of Essex, who is a, a, a really well-renowned uh, monk in, uh, in England. He's from Cyprus. But he had written more on the topic of shame. Uh, he was a disciple of St. Sophroni and had more to say about it than I'd seen anywhere else. And I spent some time with him uh, asking and talking and learning and, and discussing that. And, and coming away with a sense of uh, of a blessing to kind of take up that word uh, in my own life in ministry. Um, I'll have to say the book, which came out uh, last year, in March of last year, I think, um, I think I threw away at least five manuscripts. I wrote that book about five times over the course of 10 years and was just never, never happy with what I was doing. I would write it. I would throw it away. The last one I had finished, or the last attempt I had finished, and and I was privately not satisfied with it, but I, and I didn't quite know what to do, and I was embarrassed to tell my wife that I was going to throw it away and start over again. <laughs> because I mean, the poor dears had to read every one that I you know that failed, and uh, but it's funny I was reading somebody else's book at bedtime. Uh, one night, and I've told this authoress uh, since about it, but I was reading her book, and I've just, um, I, I, as I was reading it, I could hear her voice writing it, and I thought, and this is just how I write, is that I, I'm a very verbal person, and what I think I had been looking for in the five failed attempts was the voice. What, what, who tells this story? Who talks about this? And I think consistently in those five attempts, I was tempted to try to lecture this, to talk about it like an academic and, you know, prove my credentials and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I just couldn't find my voice. And reading her work, I, I thought I could hear it. And the next day I sat down and I didn't dare tell my wife, but I sat down and I wrote 2,500 words, which is a lot, and the first day in the new manuscript. And I thought, that's it. That's what it sounds like. And so um, I've never worked so hard to get something. Um, I mean, and I can't say that there's 10 years worth of material there by any means. What there is is, is 10 years trying to find the right way to talk about it. Um, and perhaps, I mean, and I write all the time. I mean, it's, you know, it's just, I write all the time. Writing's not hard. Um, but uh, finding the right way to talk about this was very difficult. Um, and um, so I'm, I'm actually just very pleased with, with how it turned out. Uh, you know, when I finished it, I thought I like this. And I wasn't certain how much I liked it until I did the um, audiobook version uh, for Ancient Faith. And, uh, and so you have to read your book out loud. And, uh, and again, I'm a very auditory person. And so I literally got to hear how that voice sounded. And um, 
when I finished the, the audio version, I thought, gee, I like this. I mean, some movie actors say they don't like to watch their movies. They just can't stand it. Um, and authors can perhaps be the same way. Uh, in this case, um, especially for something that had as, as, as many personal ties, uh, interior ties. So that's yeah. kind of the broad strokes of the backstory. I really appreciate that. And thank you so much for yeah. sharing your, your story with that. I think yeah. there's two things that I, I hope are encouraging for people in that. And, and, you know, one is that there's hope at the end of that story, you know, after Absolutely. many, many years of struggle. And I think in a similar way, though, there's something encouraging um, in just hearing someone be honest about their, their journey with this, because I think for so many people, well, one, there's just so many of us struggle with this. I mean, it shame is something that really touches all of us, but also anxiety. You know, we're yep. probably the most anxious generation. You know, the people on the planet today are probably the most anxious that, that we've seen. And I think sometimes in Christian circles, there's this rushing of the story that's like, I was anxious, I became a Christian, and then it was all fixed magically <laughs> overnight. And I think it's encouraging yeah. to hear someone say, like, that's not how it works. And uh, no. so if people are in that, they're not alone in that. Um, and uh, so I, I appreciate that. Um, no, I mean, I think dream on. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. Oh, I love it. One of, one of the uh, great spiritual fathers in the uh, Orthodox Church uh, once said that prayer is struggle to a man's dying breath. Mm. Um, and uh, so it's true of all of it. Um, but also, as I say, I, I I don't think struggle should ever or suffering should ever be wasted. Yeah. I, you know, I've, I've had my stuff in my own lifetime. And, um, you know, if sharing it can make a difference with someone else, uh, you know, uh, depression is a cousin of anxiety. They both come from the same place in the brain. And in fact, if you're diagnosed with anxiety and, and you look in the diagnostics book, it's anxiety slash uh, depression. They belong together. They're, they're just mm -hmm. different versions and manifestations of the same disorder. And we really don't understand it yet um, mm -hmm. on, on, say, the biochemical level. I, just this morning, I was reading an article about serotonin that we, we it's not a, a lack of serotonin uh, that produces depression, but increasing serotonin affects certain things that might, I mean, it's just more and more stuff out there. We, we're just, the brain is so amazingly complex. And there's, there's nothing in the universe just about as complex as a human brain. It's amazing. And, uh, we don't understand it um, uh, much. Uh, so, you know, it's good to be able to share these things with each other. And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Jesus came to save uh, sinners. Uh, he came to save the broken. Uh, it's the sick who need a physician. And uh, if you're not, you know, broken or sick or any of those sorts of things, then you can't be saved. <laughs> just, 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 just get real about it, you yeah. know. Um, so, anyway. absolutely, and I, I appreciate that point about just the complexity of these things because I think we should expect, therefore, that our experience of these things are going to be complicated and messy, and that you know it's not always going to follow the nice kind of hero's journey, yep. you know, and yep. all of these things. But you know, as we get into it, I, I found one line at the beginning of your book really striking that I think might be a good place to kind of set us off talking about kind of what shame is and how we. Uh, experience it. And you, you write, the process of understanding shame and slowly making our way through that difficult emotional territory can easily be described as a progressive unveiling of our face. That, that really struck me, this idea of, of understanding our shame as unveiling our face. What do you mean by that? Well, if in a sense, to talk about the face, which is a, a great biblical term, uh, it's not just biblical, it's it's multicultural. I mean, uh, many cultures talk about the face. And, I mean, the Japanese culture, saving face has to do with shame. But the sense of the face uh, as the self, um, as the true self. Um, and in some ways, um, it's tight. You know, one of the ways we experience that, I mean, goodness gracious, we have Facebook. Um, 
we do selfies. We're just all about the face and the self. Um, and uh, but it has to do in some ways with identity, which is a big deal these days too. People talking about identity. Um, one easy definition of shame is how I feel about who I am. That's one way to talk about it on an emotional level, how I feel about who I am. I mean, for instance, if you're in middle school, God forbid any of us should ever have to go back to middle school. But if you're in middle school, you don't know who you are. Just by definition, you've left home and the easy, you know, the easy definition of mom and dad and me, you know, brothers, sisters, whatever, and suddenly you're into this social mix and you don't really know who you are because you can't know. And you've got all of these people around you and you you go out. I mean, I've I've described middle school as a long, uninterrupted shame storm, you know. And so people play with identities. You know, you try on different clothes. You try on different styles of music. Uh, nowadays, you can try on different genders and all kinds of behaviors and things. But it, it's very much playing with identity. Um, and um, bullying is about identity. I mean, people call you shame names when they bully you. Um, and, you know, how you respond to that. Um, it's uh, shame is sometimes described as the unbearable emotion. I mean, to feel bad about who I am, where can you hide from that? Where can you hide from that if you feel bad about who you are? Uh, which is why. Uh, bullying, particularly in our internet world, um, we have young people committing suicide uh, because, frankly, because they cannot bear the shame, and uh, and that's you know that is tragic. Uh, but it also says that um, you know there's there's ways in which our modern culture is constructed that has heightened you know that leaves. I mean, uh, middle school kids are like naked. They, they have nothing to protect them from the shame games of middle school. And so, uh, you know, I think traditional cultures in the past, I mean, everybody, I mean, you read uh, uh, Dickens, you know, uh, you know uh, Great Expectations, whatever, you read these things, he's got his coming of age things, and they go there, they have their shame issues and stuff, but they were also other things that helped uh, probably protect people, um, but it's still a brutal, brutal thing, and and probably always has been. After some way, it's just more brutal now. Um, but uh, important in that is is as you in the quote you you pulled um, this unveiling of the face, and this is almost part of the thesis of of my whole book, is that. You know, in scripture, it says, you know, that we will behold him face to face. That's like the highest description of what it is to see God. You know, St. John, beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And um, one of the things that happens with shame is shame doesn't just hide my face from me so that I don't see the truth of who I am, it also distorts the world around me. Uh, and it can distort how I'm seeing God. I mean, if somebody says to me, God hates me, well, I think, no, he doesn't. God loves you. God died on the cross for you. I mean, how, how big does he, how big with how large a crayon does he have to write, I love you? He died for you. Uh, but something is distorting that and you feel this cosmic shame of dislike, you know, that he hates, that God hates me. Uh, God is my enemy. And uh, so um, part of the spiritual journey uh, or one way of describing the spiritual journey is moving, uh, removing the veils of that hide the true face. Now, oftentimes, uh, we don't like the true face when we see it. I want to be one of these false identities that I've created. Uh, 
one of my one of my grandsons the other day had on uh, sunglasses. He's about three, and he two and a half actually. And uh, he said, "I'm cool." And I thought, actually, I thought this is terrible. At two and a half, he knows the word cool. I mean. And it's a very interesting history that that word is a 20th century word, uh, but that's already a two and a half year old looking at a two and a half year old and trying on a different identity. Uh, not much good can come of that. No. Uh, and so, you know, but God sees me for who I am and he loves me for who I am. And, you know, in the Orthodox world, we would say he not only loves me for who I am, he's making me a god. Uh, uh, St. Gregory of Nyssa said man is mud who's been commanded to become a god. You know, uh, but we take a look at our face, what little stuff we see of it. It just looks like mud, not a god. <laughs> so, yeah, not yet. Today's video is sponsored by Logos. Logos is an online Bible software tool that fundamentally changed the way I read scripture, and it even helped me make one of the biggest theological decisions of my life. I first came across Logos a few years ago when I was studying for my theology degree, and I can truly say I don't know how I would have gotten through my degree without it. It makes in-depth word studies or theological studies or kind of exegetical studies of scripture so much faster and so much easier and helps you engage with the text on deeper levels. But you don't have to be an academic to get a lot of out of Logos. You can be just reading, leading a local Bible study and you want to go in armed with a little more context, maybe to get some ideas of what's going on in the Greek without actually knowing Greek. Or maybe you just want to do it for your own personal study. In fact, when I was wrestling personally through what does John 6 mean, I turned to Logos. And in that, I was able to go deeper into the passage than I ever would have been able to on my own. Here's how I did it. I would go to the text, and of course, you can read the text, and in my opinion, the text alone, I could go either way. Maybe it's literal, maybe it's metaphorical. But then I began looking at some commentaries. So I pulled up D.A. Carson. I could just have it up right next to the text, see what he had to say. And then I'd pull up some Catholic commentaries, see what they had to say. But then, and this is where it gets really interesting, I could go back to the Greek, and I could go back to the church fathers. For instance, I could just double-click on the word feed or eat on my flesh and see that the Greek word here is trogo. And oh, really interesting. That has a very visceral connotation to it. Little points towards the literal side. But then the real kicker for me was being able to link to all of what the church fathers said on this. It, it's absolutely insane. Like back in the day, you would have had to spend a lifetime to do this, but now all of it's right there. You just click. Okay. So what does St. John Chrysostom say on this? Oh, interesting. Or what does Ambrose say or St. Basil? And all of a sudden I was overwhelmed saying, wow, being able to see the Greek context, being able to see the best scholarship today and being able to see what the church fathers have to say about this came to the conclusion that Christ really is present in the Eucharist. And that level of study was only made possible by Lagos. That's honestly only the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to get into Lagos, if you want to deepen your Bible study, I've got some links in the description down below. You can use packages that are set up for Catholics, for Orthodox, or for Protestants, whether you want kind of more church fathers, magisterial documents, whatever. You can see it all in there. And if you use those links, and please do, you will get a discount that will make it cheaper than otherwise. And not only will you get a great discount, but I'll get some support from that as well. So if you want 10% off anything there or even more off some of their main packages, use the links down in the description. Well, thanks, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I, you know, I think that example of your grandson leads really well into the next question I wanted to ask, which is a question that might sound simple because it's brief, but I think is probably a, a bit difficult to answer. But where does our shame come from? You know, especially if it can, if it can start showing up so early in our life, where we're does born this come with it. from? Yeah. It's it. We're born with it, and it's not wrong. It's not a bad thing. It gets out of hand. I mean, it's like, you know, if you were to say to me, "Where does hunger come from?" Well, it's built. It's built into us, and it can certainly get, you know, out of control. You know, but it become a bad thing. Hunger can become gluttony. Whatever shame is. Uh, I mean, if you get to the roots of it biologically, uh, I did some study looking at what they call 
uh, affect theory, the theory of the various built-in affects we have, like joy or surprise. Take a baby, for instance. A baby, uh, you're playing peekaboo with a baby, right? And uh, you don't have to teach a baby how to play peekaboo, do you? I mean, you, you, they don't. You just do this thing and you pull it down and show your face and go peekaboo and they giggle. And you keep and they don't get tired of it. You just keep doing it. They keep giggling. Um, what's going on? Well, it's actually the built in affect called surprise. You're surprising, pleasantly surprising the baby. Now, if one time when you pulled the towel down, instead of it being your face, you had a gorilla mask on, you would have surprise, but a very different surprise and they would be screaming and crying in your face and not like it. Shame um, is hardwired and it is uh, the interruption of an expected joy uh, or an expected uh, kind of pleasant thing. It interrupts it. That's the simple explanation of it. Um, I have seen this in infants. You know, mama's got a baby a little toddler in her arms and she comes up and you know and she's showing the baby to the priest the old man scary old man in the black you know cassock with a long white beard you know and showing to the priest and you know and the baby's looking and doesn't know me from adam and i'm coo and making noises at it suddenly the bright baby breaks into you know starts crying and the mother's all embarrassed uh the baby is actually feeling in another way to describe this is the feeling of exposure. Uh, shame feels exposed, naked. I mean, that's an interruption, right? Um, it, we feel exposed and naked and we want to hide. So what does the baby do? Baby buries its face in it, you know, in its mother's chest or something. You know, it's we want to hide. It's the child hiding behind a parent's skirt or something that way and, you know, not wanting to be seen. Um, and um you know it's um they simply feel vulnerable uh Brene brown uh when she writes about shame uh popularly uh she uses the word shame uh generally always meaning something bad like it's a bad word classically uh in older writings uh and certainly in the biblical and theological language uh there is a healthy shame and a toxic shame. Uh, I mean, in other words, there's nothing sinful about the child feeling vulnerable. I mean, in fact, feeling vulnerable and having having a built-in biological, uh, I mean, you know, neurological response that says hide, that's a darn good thing because there's times you need to hide, right? I mean, you're exposed, you feel that you should hide. Um, I tell people they should, you know, uh, you should listen to those kinds of interior messages. I've got three daughters. They're all grown women now, but I've tried to tell them over the years, listen to your inner voice. You know, if it's telling you things, pay attention to it. You don't don't silence this stuff. Um, but it can easily become uh, toxic. I mean, it's healthy when it's given me accurate signals that are useful. You know that helped me know the such and read a situation better. It becomes toxic, uh, generally as a result of um, trauma, abuse, and things like that. I mean, uh, the child who is not just having some difficulty in middle school, for instance, but is being picked on, is being bullied. Um, has some sort of, uh, you know, when I was in second grade in school, I, this was in the 1960, 59, 60, I had flat feet, which, you know, big deal. Uh, but I had to wear, my mother had me wearing corrective shoes, they were called, they were high tops, and they had special heels on them and stuff. Uh, my mother was always overreacting. And I remember on the playground, a boy taunting me that first week and calling me baby shoes because they looked like little baby shoes, high tops. Uh, it was humiliating. I did two things. I went home and demanded that I get 
new shoes. I, you know, and, and and we were poor. This was a hard thing to demand. And these were expensive shoes because they had to be kind of medically made. Uh, but I didn't want to be embarrassed that way. And then the really sick thing, and this is the kind of the toxic part, is I worked hard to befriend this fellow. And he became the guy I called my best friend. And the truth was, is he bullied me for years. <laughs> that's just, and that's the kind of things we do. Uh, with We don't know what to do with their shame. So what do you do? You try to control it. How do you keep someone from bullying you and shaming you? Well, for me, it was to try to, you know, uh, befriend them somehow or other. And, uh, you know, and where it would have been healthier if you'd have had, no, I mean, in your second grade, you don't know squat. Uh, but if you had had healthy boundaries and could say, it's not okay for you to say that to me, you know, you can't do that when you're eight years old. But, you know, golly gee, maybe if you're from California or something, you know. <laughs> but but not in South Carolina, it couldn't happen, you know. So, um, but it, you know, and I would have played that in. I was the second child. I had an older brother, five years older. And so I was small. I was small for my age. Uh, he was older and athletic. And, you know, I had a lot of things as a child that made me feel small uh, and uh, not as. And so I you overcompensate and you build up, you know, uh, turns out I was smart. Um, and you can kind of turn that into a persona. Toxic shame creates personas. Um, like personalities that become the you you want the world to see. And uh, that was sort of me trying to write the five books I threw away is, uh, you know, me, the expert on shame. Instead of me, I mean, there's a couple of chapters. There's a couple of chapters I lead off in this book talking about being naked. Uh, uh, one in public on a main street in Illinois, another being so embarrassed and tongue tied that I, I think I, the lead chapter, I, I could not introduce myself to Father Tom Hopko as his great theologian. I couldn't do it. You know? um, yeah. Yeah, I um, remember both of those, those scenes in the book. You, you, you were distinguishing there between healthy shame and toxic shame. And you mentioned Brene Brown, who many people will be familiar with in this space. Yeah. I don't know for sure if she makes this distinction, but I, I think you know people like her will make a distinction where they'll use shame negatively and then they'll use guilt in a way that's maybe a bit more neutral. Yeah, or she uses vulnerability oftentimes to talk about what I'm calling healthy shame, which yeah. the, the ability to be vulnerable. Um, the term I learned from Father Zacharias, and he got this from St. Sophroni, who again mm -hmm. was a modern a modern uh, Russian saint who lived in England. Mm -hmm. um, uh, saint Sophroni taught the monks in his monastery and taught the monks who were priest monks who were going to hear confessions. He said, teach them to bear a little shame. What he meant by that, and he and I, I would have written little with capital letters. He meant healthy shame, the ability to be you know, St. Paul, and I've got a whole chapter on fools for Christ in the book. It's one of my favorite chapters in it. Uh, and it's a huge thing in orthodoxy that um, you won't find elsewhere in Christianity. I mean, there's there's some, some of it in the Catholic Church, but it's a huge thing among the Orthodox, and particularly in Russian Orthodoxy. It comes up very strongly in a lot of ortho, a lot of Russian novels and stuff. But um, and in Russian history, uh, that is, Paul calls himself a fool for Christ, you know. And so there's a way in which Paul bears his shame publicly for all to see. Um, that I become all things to all men, if by any means I might save some. Um, you know, and here's Paul being Paul was a murderer. You know. Uh, he had been a persecutor of Christians, and he doesn't try to hide that. He doesn't make excuses for it. You know, he doesn't, you know, um, you know, go through some sort of, you know, make-believe process to cover it up. He just, he admits it, um, and he has to bear that. And you can read between the lines in a number of his letters, um, he's not 
you know, he's not very well respected in a lot of places. I mean, he's Paul, the great apostle to us, but he's Paul, the persecutor to them. Um, and uh, he's not one of the 12, um, you know, and what is it in Galatians or so? He calls them the super fine apostles. <laughs> Peter, James and John, you know, uh, the uh, Jesus really close with buddies. So, <laughs> so, but he has to. Um, there's another word for this, and this is key. And I, I, I could, I would not have dared write a book on this topic. Uh, healthy shame is actually what the word humility means. Humility is the ability to bear a little healthy shame. I mean, if you can play the piano like Rachmaninoff, and you just sit down and you just rip it off, you know, or Billy Joel or something like that. You just go through the piano and someone says to you, you play very well, you know, and you go, oh, well, this, you know, it's, it's nothing special or something like that. That's actually not humility. Um, that's just being, you know, kind of generically polite or something. Uh, humility is uh, bearing the shame of your own weakness. Um, bearing, uh, I, one Romanian monk friend of mine, uh, he says his confessor back in Romania, his priest confessor says to him, be sure in confession to tell me something about yourself that you think will make me not like you. <laughs> I mean, it's bad enough. <laughs> and, and that's true about confessions. You go in and you feel like, oh, if, I can't say this, but if I do say this, he'll never respect me. I mean, the, the truth is I'm a confessor and I never hear anything in confessions that isn't pretty much things I'm doing myself or have done. It's just, we're all bozos on this bus. Um, it's just some of us are pretending we're not. And, and that's unhealthy and you won't find your face and you won't see the face of Christ clearly so long as you try to live like that. And so in, in Orthodox tradition, there's some who adopt uh, a uh, actions of foolishness that would, I mean, they would act like they were crazy. Um, some of them, St. Basil the Holy Fool and Moscow would walk around naked with chains on and in the winter and would throw things at people and would, uh, and would fuss and correct the czar to his face. And the czar was czar Ivan the Terrible. <laughs> this guy's just a nut. Um, but he was a saint. Um, he dared to do some of these things. There's, there's something, there's something about Jesus on the cross. Paul calls the cross itself foolishness. Um, Jesus, when he chooses, uh, and we'll say he chooses to be crucified, to allow himself to be crucified, crucifixion was a shameful death. It was reserved for slaves um, and or others who were simply on the level of slaves. Not a No Roman citizen could be crucified. Jesus chose to be crucified as a slave. Uh, and you hear this in uh, Philippians chapter two, that Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not think, you know, equality with God was something to cling to. But instead, it says he emptied himself. Uh, kenosis. He emptied himself. Uh, it's, it's, it's humility, and and he took on the form of a servant. It is literally as doulos. It's the form of a slave, and accepted death, even he said death on a cross, which means even a shameful death. Not it's. I heard so many bad sermons, <laughs> forgive me, so many bad sermons as a child growing up in the Baptist church that preached the pain of the cross. And the truth is, though the, it's, it's painful to have your hands and your feet, you know, pierced, but he was only on the cross for three hours. That's not very long. And I, I've seen cancer deaths that top that any time. I mean, dying of bone cancer for months, much, much more painful. Um, 
In other words, it's not the pain of the cross. And I like this in our, in our ancient Orthodox services that we do in Holy Week. It's the shame of the cross. It's the mocking and the spitting and the crown of thorns and the purple robe. It's all of these things that are that go along with being crucified like a slave. It's the shame of the cross on his shoulders. He bore our shame. We hear that back in Isaiah that he will bear our shame. And so, um, you know, if you go all the way back to Genesis, you have Adam and Eve, you know, in the first emotion described is shame. They're naked and they hear God coming and they want to hide. So they do the fig, uh, fig leaf thing. And I love the conversation that happens because God said, who told you you were naked? Which is interesting is like God didn't say anything, didn't shame them. He said, who told you you were naked? And they said, well, we we heard you coming and we hid. And and then he does change the thing from shame to guilt. He changes the conversation. He said, did you do what I told you not to do? Right. Did you eat like I told you not to? And they said, yes. And he deals with that. The guilt has consequences and he's able to deal with that. But the fascinating thing is that he makes them clothes. He clothes them. He makes them clothes. I, it says he clothed them with garments of skin. Uh, the church fathers make a big deal uh, mystically about the meaning of the garments of skin. I do kind of point out when I'm lecturing about this that it's sort of like Flintstone outfits. Uh, I mean, <laughs> you know, it just he puts on leather clothes, you know, and, and clothes them. But there's a theme that runs throughout scriptures, throughout the scriptures, uh, progressively of being clothed, that God seeks to clothe us. To, to clothe us. And uh, probably my favorite chapter in the book is on male and female. And there's a lot of things about clothing and nakedness that's about our male and femaleness. Um, you know, how to love somebody enough to such that they can be vulnerable. I mean, uh, if sex is married, sex is proper, then it's about mutual vulnerability at the very least uh and uh your spouse needs to feel safe truly safe never exploited never used as an end for your pleasure but you know you have to be vulnerable to one another uh and it's interesting i as i said i have three daughters uh and so weddings i've, I've told guys over the years do not diss the dress it's important the dress is important. I mean, even the Bible will talk about the bride of Christ, the church being clothed in white. Uh, I mean, there's going to be a bridal dress, you know. Um, in the Orthodox Church, when a priest is putting his vestments on, um, the white robe he puts on first, which represents the baptismal garment, he said, uh, it, it, it quotes the Psalms of being clothed uh, with righteousness. and um, as a bride uh, adorns herself, so my God has adorned me. And actually, a priest compares himself to a bride. <laughs> Just, but um, you know, we all want that. You know, when you go clothes shopping, I mean, there's there's practical clothes shopping like shoes or something. Uh, although women are far more than practical, and I am too. I've got a lot of shoes, um, but you want to look good. There's things about that and and um identity plays a role in your clothing you know um it's and identity is always has some element of shame um do i feel safe to leave the house looking like this uh, first time when i when i went to seminary i was an episcopalian i went to an episcopal seminary and i remember the first time i put on a clerical collar like their priests wear you if i had one now you couldn't see it because of my beard but um the uh, i looked at myself in the mirror and i as you talk about feeling weird and the first time i went out in public wearing it even gosh you think everybody in the world is staring at you the first time after I became Orthodox and I was appearing in public wearing a cassock, I knew they were staring at me and saying funny things to me. And I'm here in East Tennessee where they've never seen 
things like that before. I had strangers coming up to me in stores and asking me if I was a rabbi, despite the fact that I'm wearing a very large cross. Uh, <laughs> um, in Walmart here in Oak Ridge, I remember one time after midnight, some guy crossing around behind me, it's very Appalachian, and, uh, and shouting, Mazel Tov. <laughs> Just like as if, as if I went looking for him because I was angry about it, uh, not because he was insulting me, but because I don't like anti-Semitism. <laughs> you shouldn't shout at the Jews, please. Thank you. Um, but um, getting to uh, identity, uh, getting past that, um, you know, how do you feel safe with God? Do you feel safe when you pray? Uh, think about C.S. Lewis uh, and that wonderful image in uh, the Chronicles of Narnia and the concern about Aslan the lion. Is he safe? And, you know, the question is asked, is he safe? And, your res and the response is, safe? No, but he's good. <laughs> so there's this, there's a level of vulnerability. He's not a pussycat, but he's good. And so, you know, he will, he will lead me to a cross. He promised me. Whosoever would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You know, and unless you happen to be in some place where you're getting persecuted, that cross is coming most often like the cross of Christ and lots of elements of shame, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, I would say with toxic shame, and I just, I emphasize this in the book too, is uh, a lot of it can come from uh, uh, abuse of various sorts and toxic shame can be really, really dangerously uh, painful. And uh, one of the problems about shame is it's public. It, it, it's between me and some other person. It's not just me, although there can be things that way, but it, it oftentimes needs another human being to help me get over it. And uh, if there's issues of toxic shame in which it's, it's you know, almost creating its own personality and just dogging you uh, frequently, uh, uh, therapy can be quite useful. Uh, I find, uh, I mean, Private confession be, can be therapeutic in that way, uh, particularly if the priest knows what he's doing or whatever. A very good uh, confidant, and in fact, in marriage, it can be that way. But these are the difficulty with these situations is that they must be safe, because you have to feel safe enough to be vulnerable to pull back the curtain and be seen, and then be loved and be healed. Um, and that takes time. I mean, it takes someone. Um, one of the early writers on shame, and, and this is really interesting. I mean, like Freud and Jung, they never talked about shame. Great fathers of modern psychology, they didn't talk about it. Um, a lot of modern writing on shame came out of the uh, recovery movement, out of AA, and working with that. Yeah, uh, alcoholics, you know, they were an inner laboratory. And if it didn't work, you drank again. And shame can be a huge issue in alcoholism and drug uh, disorders and addictions and stuff because, you know, that's why they say things like it's not, uh, it's not a sin, it's a disease. Because, you know, the stupidity of when people talk about sin, they talk about it in a way that you're a bad person. Very unhelpful. Uh, I've even learned to say sin's not a sin, it's a disease. Uh, it and and that's actually more biblical. Sin works like a disease, not like a legal problem. Uh, in my first book, uh, I write in there that you don't have a legal problem; you have a death problem. Sin is like death, a disease working in us. But uh, you need to be able to be vulnerable enough uh, to share that with someone else, and someone else who can hear it and help you get past it. But uh, an early writer in the eighties, seventies, eighties. Uh, was uh, John Bradshaw wrote a book called Healing the Shame That Binds Us. Excellent book. 
he, he uses terms healthy and toxic. Um, he did some later work though on, uh, and was one of the people coining the term, the inner child. Um, I feel like a pop psychology book here, but it's still there. But in the Psalms, it says, I have quieted my soul or my soul is, I've quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Have I quieted my soul? It's an image the psalmist knows that this troubled soul within us is like a child and like a, about a toddler, a weaned child, about three years old. Um, so, I mean, the Psalms know the inner child and that you have to deal with it. And, you know, if that's when the shame began, when you experience it, you're three years old again. You know, you're eight years old again, you're 10 years old again, you, you know, and you, it's just, it's awful. Shame, a real, like a, Shame can be like being hit in the face. Um, there's a break with your other emotions. Uh, you become irrational. It makes you want to hide. You don't think well. You 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 come up with the answer later, but never at the at the moment. It's just awful. It's, who wants to feel it? But there's ways through it. And the healthy stuff. Um, learning to bear the healthy stuff, little by little little by little um which is something a friend a friendship can do I've, I've almost been married 50 years and um my early panic attacks uh were also near the time i was first engaged and so my wife has been uh my best friend for all of those years and now for the years of of wellness but um I, I learned a lot in these past, you know, 12 years or so of opening and talking with her. There's some things that, you know, I found it useful to talk with a therapist about rather than my spouse. But, you know, um, you know, we've we've pulled the veil back in cre many, 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 many veils as we as we reveal the truth of ourselves and discover that we are loved. Um, I mean, that's that's I mean, there's a reason why the relationship with God is compared to marriage throughout the scriptures. Um, it, you know, heaven is the marriage feast and the veils are all removed. And we see him as the scripture says, we see him as he is and he sees us for who we are and we won't run away. We won't run away. Um, and so. Um, Anyway, yeah, no, that, that's wonderful, and there, there's so much there, and I, I've enjoyed all of that, and thank you so much for it. I think on that last point, it's just so important that you know, as, as we see God uh, more clearly, as, or as we recognize that God is seeing us clearly, our conception of God is going to have such a big impact on on how that feels for us, right? This idea that God sees us. Yeah. But you mentioned here, and I think you know, at the time that we have left, it could be good to get on kind of the practical level. We've talked so much about shame and healthy shame versus toxic shame where it comes from what that you know kind of the journey is like and i think all of this is going to be really helpful for people um at the tail end of your last uh answer there you mentioned but there are ways through it and you've touched on things like therapy and confession but for the person who they're just in the thick of this right now and they're like yeah yep. all of this i hear because you know, I don't just recognize he's saying true things about reality, but he, he's saying things that I, I'm in the middle of, and, and I'm, yeah. I'm in the pits of this, and he's saying there's ways through it, and if there are, I want to know them. What do you yeah. have to say to that person about, you know, what are the, the ways through it? What are kind of some of those uh, more practical things that can help someone who's just really feeling uh, in, in the pits here? Yes, it's... Um... And there's all kinds of things that can take us uh, into that. And no matter what it is, uh, even if it's something that classically as Christians, we would describe as sin, um, nothing, uh, St. Paul says, can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And I, I spend a lot of time trying to tell people to get it settled in their heart that God loves them. I mean, just settle it. It's, it's like, this is not the question. He, he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. The cross settles it and proclaims it. And there's lots of people who then want to put conditions on that. 
you know, that, yes, he loves you, but you have to whatever. And I think, ah, oh, just go make it harder, please. Uh, <laughs> it's, he, he just loves you. Um, and um, and he wants he wants us to be whole and that whatever it is that is going on in our life, including sin, including addictions, including personality disorders, including you name it, whatever it is. Um, uh, he still loves us in spite of that and is working with us. Finding places of support in that. Um, and this is, you know, we're not lone rangers. Uh, Christianity is not a lone ranger religion. It's not just me and Jesus. It is, you know, Jesus gave us the church. The church is not just a human institution. It is God's gift. It's a difficult thing. And it's also true that people have been abused by the church. It, it just happens. Um, and it can happen without knowing. I remember when I was 10 years old, I heard our, in a rather private setting, I heard our preacher tell a lie. Well, and it was a pretty harmless lie, but it broke my heart. I was just 10 years old. Well, I wouldn't call that abuse. I mean, you know, like the way they talk about abuse these days, but the first immediate effect it had on me, I didn't want to go to church. And my mother was having trouble. And over the next number of weeks, I kept saying I did not want to go. And it took her a long time before I would tell her why. And it was, you know, um, these things were difficult. I wound up moving to a different church with my brother. It's the long story with all of that. But you know, these things, so it, it's, it, it, when I say church, it's not a magic bullet, uh, which the same is true of, of ministers and priests. Um, but uh, confidential relationships that are trustworthy are important. Wise relationships and wise counsel in the midst of that trusty work, this trustworthiness is important. I would say to somebody, if you don't have that in your life, pray for it. <laughs> pray for it. Uh, God is a good God and he does uh, care about us and wants to help us. Ask for it. Um, and, um, you know, if, if there's a need for therapy, whatever. But also, uh, you know, be patient if you can and if you need to be. Um, one of the difficulties about being young is your story is very short. You know, there's maybe a chapter or two in it and the story is really war and peace. It's a very, very, very long novel. And um, I'm an old man and, uh, you know, I can see the end of my life because if I'm lucky, I'll get another 15 years, maybe. Uh, so that's nothing. I, I've seen 15s go by any number of times. Um, but, you know, things can come along that, you know, kind of knock my feet out from under me. But I've been on the floor before and I know how to get back up, you know, and I have a, a lifelong narrative. I said to my wife a few years ago, you know, I'm not really afraid to die. I've already accomplished more than I thought I would. I mean, yes, I, I, this is life's been better to me than I thought, you know, it was going to turn out. So, you know, uh, I don't have a lot of big goals left uh, other than to live well and to live fruitfully and to give thanks to God for all things. But when you're young, especially, you know, teenagers, early 20s and things that way, 30s even these days, and, and you're still putting things together. A setback can feel like your whole life. You know, you can have a bad week and it feels like your whole life, but you don't have a narrative to put it in perspective. Um, sometimes I would tell people spend if you're young, spend time with old people. It's not a cure, but it's a help. First off, they've seen a lot and you're going to find more wisdom there. Uh, the church properly should span all ages. And, and put us into these relationships. Uh, somebody's wiser than your parents. <laughs> it may be your parents, but it's someone's probably wiser than them. Um, so, you know, relationships matter. Um, they really matter. Um, and um, be careful of somebody wanting to make you be 
who you're not. Uh, you know, first off, uh, and I try, I try to tell people things like this. You're going to get it wrong. You know, America, America is a success story. And as success stories go, it's a big lie. The American dream is a lie. We are not saved by our success. Uh, St. Paul makes it clear. He puts it in Bible language and says we're saved by grace and not by works. I like to put it in more contemporary language and say uh, that we're saved by our weakness, not by our excellence. It's my weakness and my vulnerability that enable me to see the truth of myself and to find God. My excellence is usually a smokescreen, you know, that I can hide behind. Um, and when you start thinking that you need a, a whole lot of excellence in order to succeed in this world, you, you know, I don't want to be a Hollywood star. They're not the examples of successful people. These are by and large, really bad examples. Um, Jesus says, by their fruits, you shall know them. It's not a fruitful place. It's filled with failed relationships and darkness and, and abuse um, and, and worse. You know, they're living proof that money doesn't buy happiness. It just buys stuff, you know. And so uh, you want a, a, a better, wiser guide than that. And they're, they're all around us. Um, I also uh, try to be very honest about this. And this is everybody will suffer if they're living a normal human life. Everybody will suffer. It's not failure. It's normal. Um, and uh, God will bring good to us, even in the midst of our suffering. Um, modernity, the modern world, tries to tell us to avoid suffering, and the success is avoiding suffering. That's a lie, you know. And America hides um, its suffering. It's we have a long history of building a country on the suffering of other people, and then acting as if we didn't make them suffer. They, they didn't pay the price for us to be doing what we're doing. It's a lie. Instead, to be a Christian is to take up your cross. That's to embrace the suffering that is inherent in your existence. Unite it with the suffering of Christ, who for our sake, I mean, if, if you don't suffer, you won't know him. It doesn't mean we go, you don't have to go create it. It'll come your way. God will send you just the stuff you need. You know, maybe the devil will pick it up and add some more. But, you know, um, but understand that uh, the American dream is designed to shame you and then control you to make you do what somebody else wants you to do. It's just a big sales campaign. Uh, don't do that. So that's some practical stuff from an old man. I really appreciate uh, that. Father Stephen, this has yeah. been an absolute, uh, an absolute pleasure to have you on on the show today. I, I really appreciate Enjoy. all of your insight into this. And I feel like I've been able to do what, you know, in small part, you, you suggested there at the end of being able to, to listen to someone with much more wisdom than I have with many more years of experience than I have. And so, you know, if, if no one else saw this, I would consider it uh, a great privilege <laughs> of mine. Um, but Thank the fact that I get to, to share it with you. others is a real pleasure as well. Uh, well so may God bless it and, and bless your work. Um, in, in your many conversations. Thank you for doing this for us all. It is my pleasure.